This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 717, recorded on February 5th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. <clears throat> so I look out the window and, and you can see me and I can see you. We've got, uh, you know, mixed clouds. It's uh, no wind. Thank goodness. We had a lot of that day before yesterday and uh, it's cold. It's absolutely cold. It was raining this morning, but it's not anymore. That's, that's all I can tell you. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Howdy. Howdy. The weather is meh. <laughs> it's uh, 54 degrees headed for 58. Cloudy. Meh. Meh. We used that word on Wednesday too, meh. Yeah. With respect to some result, which I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's uh, 34 Fahrenheit, 1 Celsius, and it is slushing today in western Massachusetts. We have a mix of rain and snow switching back and forth and turning everything to mud. We have two guests today. They are both from Rockefeller University. They have both been on TWIV twice before. Uh, Theodora Hatsuanu, welcome back. Thank you. With 465 and 662. And Paul B. Nash, welcome back. Very nice to be with you uh, from the other side of Manhattan, where it's a balmy, <laughs> comparatively speaking, 45 degrees. Paul was on 439 and 551. And one of those was here in studio, if I remember. Oh, both of you were here in studio once. Mm -hmm. In the old days. Yep. I don't know if we'll ever do that again. But you guys now, this is, I remember, because we went to your office, Paul. That's your office looking over the East River. So cool. Yep. Yeah, and, it's a nice view. And Very you, have, nice. you have a plant behind, behind each one of you. <laughs> yes. Your, your desk is facing the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a money tree behind us. And uh, we have taken various cuttings money and there are a number of them around the office. Oh. Every, every lab should have a money tree. <clears throat> yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't have a money tree. All right, uh, Paul and Theodora, um, we're going to talk to you about your work. We've already heard your... Um, histories on previous episodes, so we don't need to do that. So what I, what I wanted to start off with was you have uh, very early in this pandemic pivoted to SARS-CoV-2 and um, in particular looking at the immune responses in people. And I wonder, um, you know, what, what was behind the decision to do that? And also you're, you're collaborating with a lot of people. How did that come about? And ha you're both retrovirologists does any of that still go on? <laughs> so, Theodora, why don't you start? Um, I don't. Um, I don't think we jumped extremely early. We actually mm -hmm. debated about joining the uh, SARS-CoV-2, or cut, shall we call it, bandwagon, mm -hmm. right, uh, for a couple of months. And if you recall, our first uh, venture into the field was more um, an activist. Action where we signed the le sent a letter yeah. to the mayor to close the schools down, and we got signatures from many many researchers. Because at the time, the it was very clear that he, there was not being enough being done regarding school transmission. And uh, during that time, we we were seriously debating: should we start? Should we do something? Should we not do something? I, and of course, it was everybody's doing this. What can we do that's going to be different? And in the end, we thought, well, we we can't work with SARS-CoV-2 itself, but we do know a thing or two about envelope, viral envelopes and pseudotypes. Mm. So we could develop assays. And in the end, I think we are both extremely happy that we did this. So when, um, of course, circumstances helped and Michelle Nussenzweig is in the same campus as us, and as he started looking at antibodies from uh, infected uh, people, he approached us and says, well, can we look at neutralization? And luckily, yes, we had just 
started developing the assets and we could say yes. And we were actually just discussing what would have happened if we said, you know what? Nah, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Paul? And it, it worked out well. Any thoughts, Paul? Yeah, I mean, I think from from reasonably early on, it sort of be, once we began to appreciate the gravity and seriousness of how the pandemic was unfolding, it sort of became clear to us that um, antibodies were going to be a key part of how we got through this pandemic, whether that was um, antibodies elicited by vaccines or convalescent plasma therapy or monoclonal antibody therapy. Um, really, the, the ability to measure measure antibodies in a robust, accurate, high throughput way is something that, you know, we, we could easily do. Mm. Um, and our, our colleagues here at Rockefeller, you know, provide the context for that. So Michelle's pioneered methods for cloning antibodies. And it, it really, I think, started out um, really in a sort of a, an emergency mode, trying to help institutions get their convalescent plasma protocols off the ground. They needed to be able to measure neutralizing antibodies, though it turns out they didn't really realize that. Um, and with Michelle, um, uh, just identifying the most potent antibodies for therapy was our initial goal. And that sort of morphed into a sort of um, a more in-depth understanding of the B cell immune response to, to the infection. So um, really it was, it was in part context, in part sort of an emergency response to the, the pandemic and where we thought we could have the biggest mm -hmm. impact that would actually help us get through. Um, and so that, that underlay a, a a large part of our decision process. I mean, we have done some other other work on SARS-CoV-2, not ready for prime time yet, but um, really, I think the central role of antibodies in getting through the pandemic, I think, is what motivated us to to jump in. So you've done all of this work with pseudotyped viruses, not SARS-CoV-2, because there's no BSL-3 on campus, correct? But that's not exactly true. So a really important partner in this work has been Charlie Rice, who does have a BSL-3. And so all of our um, pseudotyped and chimeric virus assays, we've measured them against real virus and shown that they they correlate very, very closely indeed. Um, I know there's a, there's a little bit of discomfort around the use of um, pseudotypes, but the assays we're using are very carefully validated that they have very strong predictive value for neutralizing activity against the authentic virus. So what sort of pseudotypes uh, do you use and are they any different than what other people use? Uh, we use uh, both HIV and VSD, uh, mainly HIV for large throughput assays, usually HIV, just because the system is is simpler. In terms, you just transfect a couple of plasmids and you have your virus and you measure assays. I mean, and we do thousands, thousands of neutralization assays a week. I don't think you would be able to do that with a classic plaque forming assay with a real virus in any uh, reasonable scale. Uh, we also uh, developed the uh, um, similar pseudotype uh, system with VSV. That's slightly more uh, tricky to work with if you don't have experience working with a virus. But we have also made a chimeric VSV. That is a virus that contains the SARS-CoV-2 uh, coding envelope coding region within its uh, genome. So it can actually replicate bat entry and obviously neutralization are dependent on the uh, spike. So that has proven very useful for some of the um, assays that we we'll probably discuss a little bit later. So is the uh, HIV pseudotype uh, like a fluorescent readout or something like that? that so that's what facilitates facilitates it being rapid? It has a dual reporter virus, so it has uh, and the nanoluciferase, which allows, as you just mentioned, for really high throughput, and you just basically place the plate in a reader and you can get your okay. light units read out. But it also has GFP, so we could actually measure infectious titers and correlate 
what sort of level of infection we're getting with the luciferase we're measuring. So we know we have a really uh, very good dynamic range in our assay. So. You know, it makes me yeah, very... So- it makes me very sad to hear you say that a plaque assay can't keep up. <laughs> Sorry. No. I mean, it's, not it's, as fast. In, it's important to recognize that each assay has its, has its idiosyncrasies, strengths and weaknesses. Um, we, we participated in a sort of a nationwide um, standardization approach where blinded sera were sent to, to many laboratories doing pseudotype assays, doing real virus assays. And there's really nothing magic about using the real virus. You know, the, the level of noise, laboratory to laboratory variation with authentic virus with pseudotype virus, they're they're both all over the place when you compare uh, laboratory to laboratory. So what we, as Theodora says, what we've been very careful to do is really understand the dynamic range of what the assay can tell you. Understand that just because your luminometer can read up to 10 to the 7 light units, that in no way means you have a, an assay that has a dynamic range of 10 to the 7. It's really the number of infected cells in each well um, that, that you're measuring a surrogate for. And so, uh, you know, we have a pretty, pretty good understanding of what the strengths and weaknesses of our assays are. Um, and I think the Proof of the pudding is in what we've done. I mean, we identified really potent uh, monoclonal antibodies um, that were authenticated, uh, verified using an authentic SARS-CoV-2 virus, and they they protect in animal models, and they're now in clinical trials. So um, that you know, that's what the assays are for, and they've done what they were supposed to. So. And these these um, pseudotype assays, I mean, this is extending from stuff that you'd done in your retrovirus work, right? I mean, you were building on things that you'd done previously. Yeah, so I think I might be right in saying that our lab may have made um, perhaps the greatest variety of chimeric and pseudotype viruses of any laboratory in the world. <laughs> That might be an exaggeration, but if we're not the top one, we're certainly in the top few. So we have a lot of experience of mixing and matching bits of viruses and putting them together. Um, you know, I mean, Theodora's made a bunch of chimeric SIV, HIVs. Um, we've made viruses with ancient virus envelopes in both pseudotype and replication competent forms. So we sort of, I think, can claim to know what we're doing when it comes to this sort of thing. <laughs> your, your pseudotypes are us, right? Yeah. Yes, that's, that's really like And we we were always, as Paul mentioned, we have been, in part of what you're saying is true because we've always been interested in tropism, whether it is uh, conferred by the envelope receptor interaction or by subsequent um, cellular proteins. And uh, some reagents, so for example, some reports of uh, we already had for we had been using them for other things and we just adjusted the assays to use spike instead yeah. of other envelopes. Right. So yes, I think we were in a good position to start and then refine it based on this new yeah. uh, virus we wanted to study. Yeah. I mean, I think even before the pandemic, there wasn't a day that passed in this lab without us quantifying infection hundreds of times every day. That's what we do. (laughs) So speaking of pre-pandemic, has any of your former work continued or what's the story there? So, so when, when the, it just so happened that when we decided to start in March, it was when the first big lockdown in New York city. So the city went basically shut down and the university did the same. So they uh, uh, announced uh, and it was, I think from very short notice that all uh, activities should cease within a certain time and only uh, SARS-related activities would continue. So we had actually, of course, as we mentioned, we were not working on this. So, and every person postdocs, students, technicians had their own projects. So, and we knew that it was going to be slightly complicated to get into work and all these things. So we're very careful to ask for volunteers. So we told the people in the lab, this is what we want to do. 
uh, do you want to be part of this effort or not? And it was entirely up to them to decide whether they wanted to join or not. And we were very lucky that uh, several did. So Fabian, Yiska, Frauke, and Magda, uh, a tech, and later Feng on... Wen. Feng Wen, yes. Yeah. Just, uh, Feng Wen and later and on Zhao. Justin and Zhao. So we had a good team that said, okay, we are going to come in during the uh, lockdown. Luckily, most of them lived in faculty housing, as you know. So they were very, it was very easy for them to commute. They just walk. And we made sure the others could come in by bike and no mass transport. <laughs> and uh, they they really got working. And I think the all together, we've never worked as hard as we've worked during that period. And subsequently, it was really, um, I, but it was really this feeling that we want to do something. We want to really make a difference. And um, that was driving everyone. But it was, it's really very intense, but rewarding, yeah. I think. It, it was, I, you know, the first few weeks, months of the lockdown, I think, were, were a very difficult time, um, very stressful for everyone concerned. Uh, you, you can imagine the sort of pressure on the the people working in the lab to sort of get these assays working um, that really what you're doing might be vital in terms of developing medicines to um, to tackle this pandemic and at the same time being part of a much bigger collaboration you know with Michelle Nussenzweig's lab at Charlie Rice's lab Pamela Bjorkman's lab we've also been working very closely with their their at Caltech and um, really um, a lot of people sort of you know, setting their own work, their own ambitions to one side. To it was a really, it's really been a different way of doing science. You sort of part of a much, a much bigger effort. And I think our, you know, our postdocs and the the people in other labs uh, deserve a lot of credit for that. They really, while everyone else was locking down, they were working twenty four seven. And uh, I'm sure the same is true in many labs across the country, but it's, it's, things are not quite as intense now, but it's been a difficult year for a lot of people working in laboratories. Now, in terms of um, putting other projects aside and coming back to them later, we've sort of been dealing that on a very individual basis. So it, the SARS-CoV-2 work, as, as well as being important at this particular time is not scientifically uninteresting. It's actually really um, fascinating science. And so we have a number of people in the lab who had projects on HIV before and then switched to working to SARS-CoV-2. And each one of them is facing what's not a particularly easy decision about whether to continue both projects, to switch back, to continue focused on SARS, I mean, we, we uh, as a lab, want to continue uh, coronavirus research, but, um, you know, we, we were already spread pretty thin before the pandemic, and now that, that problem's even, even greater. But in a sense, we're sort of spoilt for choice about interesting things to, to work on. Um, and so we're, we're, we're still evolving that yeah. process, actually, um, and as I say, individual people are coming to different decisions about whether and how to reintroduce HIV and other viruses back into their into their um, repertoire. I'd say at the moment, probably about half the lab's activity is SARS-CoV-2 and half is what we were doing before. It's not a bad problem to have, right? <laughs> to have interesting so, things. I'd like to ask something also because... Um, when you uh, go to Netflix or look at the latest movies that come out, the apocalyptic type of movies, you always see this gigantic meteorite heading towards Earth and all of a sudden the entire world scientists band together to find a solution. And it's an imaginary mind game that they're playing, but this is not imaginary. Uh, this, is, this is actually what happened and the meteor actually you know, wasn't, heading towards Earth that it was already here. So you've established this network of closely knitted, similarly committed people who want to make a difference uh, now for a health reason. Do you think in six months from now, the enthusiasm will still be there? Well, 
when we started, we thought it would be over by now. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't make a difference. <laughs> so, every, it, seriously, and uh, we're still going, and it's still every every um, every time we meet. Yeah, no, I think it's going to go on for a while. I don't know if it's going to move on beyond SARS and to other projects between our labs. I think. I think it's very hard to force these things to happen. They when they happen um, naturally and because of the uh, let's say uh, expertise uh, of each lab coming together and being more um, uh, how can I say efficient than each lab working on its own uh, project, then that works out. But if you're trying to force people to work together when there's not really that much synergy, then it doesn't. Uh, no, doesn't exactly work. right. Exactly. So the other th- question know. that raises um, itself also in relation to that is that you were funded from, I presume, a government agency to work on um, HIV. And all of a sudden, and I can see you're cringing. <laughs> Would you like this to be anonymous? <laughs> what are you, you going to tell the study section you did? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's the point. That, 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 do you imagine that in the near future, there'll be a different funding system for pooled resources to allow scientists to drop what they're doing and to start working on something in an emergency nature where the funding s- stream comes from this pool of money set aside for just that? Would that be a good idea, do you think? Yes. So, so one of the things that, that enabled us to um, pivot so quickly and seamlessly is um, so in our little in our little group. Well, let, let me just back up a bit. It, it's it's not true to say that there was there were non-existent collaborations between us before the pandemic. Right, so right. Michelle and Pamela Bjorkman have been working quite closely together for for some time. Uh, and to some extent with Charlie Rice as well. Our own lab has lots of sort of informal contact with with both Michelle and Charlie's group. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we were building on a, a collaborative structure that was already there in sort of nascent form. It, we just, we didn't even formalize it. We just built on, on what was there. In terms of funding, um, now it really helped that, Two of us are HHMI investigators, and there are no, really no strings attached to that money. Um, Rockefeller is quite generous with institutional yes. support. Um, and so we, we've done everything we've done in the past year, at least our group, without a penny of grant support from, wow. from the government for SARS-CoV-2 work. We, you know, we almost felt we didn't have time to write grants on this stuff. Oh, we didn't. We didn't, didn't. Um, we until, until very recently. Sure. Um, so that, that has changed in the past few weeks. And we, we've, uh, as a group, we've written a program project um, that was submitted early January um, to, develop, to develop vaccines that will provide broad immunity to coronaviruses, right? So looking forward to the next pandemic and what this pandemic means for that and how one would build on the immunity that will already be established um, to perhaps provide a defense against SARS-3. So, so yes, we've, we've, of course, we've used some of our existing funding for other viruses to do this work. Um, And, you know, we will rise or fall when those grants come up for renewal, but Sure. You know, I think we had to do it. Yes. But it's not just about the use of the money. It's about the progress that you showed for the other projects that you didn't work on. Yes. No, a lot of people get stuck on that. And I know I myself personally did also because I had several moves in my career. But the laboratory itself had to move to a separate place. When that happened, you lose three, four or five months of work sometimes if you're not a big group. And then you say, well, wait a minute, I put it on pause. You're not judging me for that time, are you? Mm-hmm. Of course we are. And, you know, we don't care about you. We care about how we spend our money. And, and, and it sort of shoves the investigator to the side. And, and I think that's unkind for the kind of emotional commitment that you make to these projects. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You're, you're passionate about this. You can't buy passion. Yeah. You either are or you're not. And you are obviously very passionate about this. And I, I don't know how you could punish somebody for doing what you did. 
No. By not funding the next program that you were <laughs> set to inherit. My, my, my suspicion is that at least within NIAID, the relevant institute at NIH, that um, reviewers and program there will look will look kindly on people who were working on other viruses, pivoted and actually did something useful. Yeah, Especially I, I if think they got the, the vaccine. The, the, sense, the sense that I get from, um, from talking to various people who are involved in various aspects of this is that there, under the current circumstances, there will be some forbearance for yeah. people who shifted into working on the pandemic. For I mean, the... Uh, for the listeners, uh, a funding source that Paul mentioned uh, was HHMI, which is the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which we could do a whole show on itself. Right. It's a fascinating resource. Yeah. So this it, this addresses uh, some of the objections that Vincent has raised in the past with regards to the sequestering of data and uh, application in industrial uh, laboratories rather than in um you know, academic at laboratories, so that uh, the, the information only emerges when a product comes out of the door. But uh, in this case, uh, I'm sure that a lot of basic research contributed to their uh, ability to react so fast to produce these spike proteins. Yes, absolutely. I'm, su I'm sure that's true. Well, and in fact, um, not last week's TWIV, uh, last, uh, uh, what was, what episode was it? I lose count. The one we recorded last Friday. Um, with, uh, Jason. with Jason, <laughs> um, we, we had a discussion of some of the basic science that went into that. And, and as it yeah. happened, yeah. Um, just this week, I did a piece for the New York Academy of Sciences. They had a meeting on Tuesday where they had Tuesday and Wednesday where they had a bunch of people um, talk about uh, various aspects of the pandemic response. And one of them was Tony Fauci, huh. who um, gave a really good historical perspective, um, basically on the idea that. Uh, yeah, we we saw the development of vaccines in 11 months from the publishing of the sequence to, you know, approval of a vaccine. Uh, but it actually took 20 years to get to the point that we could develop a vaccine in 11 months. And he talked a lot about the um, uh, the vaccine research center at NIH and, yeah. um, you know, NIAID's groundwork on this and <laughs> all the spike protein work that went into it and all the basic science and the that led up to the point where you basically had a system that was spring loaded to be able yeah. to do this exact thing. Um, and, and that's what you get by building a strong base of basic science. Good choice of words. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, and it's not, it's not just the basic science as well. Even right. some of the clinical networks that were set yes. up to do HIV vaccine trials. And Tony, Tony mentioned that specifically. Yes. Um, it, you know, the, when, when, when a pandemic like this comes along, you, you, you just can't wait for grant applications to go in to, to support the work. You just have to get on with it. Um, well, and there's a there's a longstanding saying in the disaster response community that a, a disaster response is a come as you are party. Right. So right. whatever you've built up to that point, that's what you've got. And that's it, it so happened that in certain ways we we were well positioned to respond to this. Yeah. So regarding Dixon's idea about how, how would you if you would have a pool of money that you would have safeguarded for lab to give to labs in times like this it's very hard in the beginning to know because it's not just passion it's also competence who is going to this is true. really this is true. produce the results you're after yeah, no, you're right you're so right. it's i don't know if there was i would be happy if they did if they did not judge too harshly if i have not met all the goals of my ro1 at the time of review yeah. and I don't know, be more lenient in terms of renewal uh, rather than give me money up, up front. Because Maybe one of the requirements should be you have an R01. So that proves your competence and uh, you've <laughs> passed through some level of judgment. And the next thing you know, you're eligible for application to a pool of money, which is small. And then based on your progress, it gets bigger and bigger. And it's an internationally contributed fund so that the WHO and the United Nations and all these other governing bodies takes part in the dispersion of this money so that everybody gets a, a little bit of a fair share. It yeah. unites the world together in a common cause, basically. What I I'm love saying. Dixon's optimism. 
Yes. Well, I was, I was, <laughs> remember, without optimism, you have nothing. I, um, I agree. But I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here cynically thinking that uh, what are the odds that politicians are actually going to keep a pool of money untouched over a period of more no. than I don't know a month? No. Yeah. It's it. The idea of flexible funding is. Um, but but one one model that I think could could be more widely used it really sort of mimics what hhmi does and that that's really to not have it project based but to have it um person based and yeah, you, you show up every 5 years and they ask what did you do and if you if you did a good job then you get get some more money to to that's, to work on whatever you think is sure. interesting that's mill hills uh, approach yeah. also over in uh, england and uh, I, I like it very much by the way and you know, obviously, obviously, you have to strike a balance between what 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 NIH needs to do and what scientists should be free to pursue on on their own. But having it, you know, I would say something like 30, 40 percent of the budget just just let the scientists do what they think is absolutely is most interesting. Follow your curiosity. Isn't that so, what you know, uh, when somebody says, I'm sorry, Vincent, I just wanted to make one more. Point sorry, go, ahead. go ahead. You couldn't possibly have convinced any funding uh, stream that working on bats was important 20 years ago. I'm sorry. Okay. Rabies is a big deal. Bats. Who cares? Right. And now it turns out yeah. bats. Wow. So yeah, now what yeah. else is, is there's got to be another bat like animal out there that we have to watch out for as well. So or, I mean, or coronaviruses for that massive extent. Yeah, sure. You're here. Well, that's yeah. exactly right. I mean, isn't <laughs> yeah. this uh, what Google does? They let them do 20% of their time on whatever they want, right? Yeah. yeah. And Rich, you would know that, right, Rich? Your son works for yeah, Google. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the model. I mean, it's a good idea. People come up with stuff when you let them go. And NIH shouldn't be so. I, I agree. I think it should, there should be a certain percentage of investigator. Uh, I think if you're funding. an organization with as much money as Google, that may work very well. It works well <laughs> if you're going for a postdoc. Right. Yeah. Uh, Alan, That's we the can, perfect time to do whatever you want. Alan, the U.S. <laughs> has a lot of money. We can just manufacture it. doesn't matter if we borrow it, right? <laughs> right, right. Well, the, yeah, the U.S. does. The, the NIH may people. not have quite as much. <laughs> I'm right. sitting here thinking that uh, in the current circumstance, without any of these formal mechanisms in place, the response has been pretty impressive. Yes, people have impressive. people very have uh, cobbled right. together what they needed to do, and uh, pooled their expertise. Uh, thank God for the internet, man. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, you know, it took a, it it took a meteor, a meteor-like situation that the Earth is going to get destroyed if we don't do something to make that happen. Yeah, um, and you know, I don't want to be too critical of my colleagues, but I, I would say. The, there's been some really, really very good science has been done um, over the past year, and it's really made a difference. But um, Theodora has sat on some of the grant review panels that has reviewed <laughs> coronavirus um, proposals, and well, I won't, I won't put words in your mouth. I'm not but. allowed to talk about it. <laughs> I can't put <laughs> so Theodore is responding would anonymously. Say, would you say that there is a wide anonymously, variation of yeah. quality in those proposals? <laughs> yeah, but so, that's you need a gatekeeper someplace. I don't. So uh, again, uh, let me just say one thing. The thing that struck me most in the early ones, and this is the emergency funding, is that there were no virologies, no virologists. None of the applicants had any experience in virologists and had mm. most of them didn't even have a collaborator, a, a virologist collaborator. So there was some pretty wild stuff proposed. So <laughs> and published as well, a lot of nonsense yes. published. published. Too. So uh and it's I think it's exactly this. The competent people were all very busy doing the work and didn't have time to submit grants, and everybody who had an idea that might they might mm. be able to fit SARS-CoV-2 in it, too. they just went sure. for it. What, what the interesting I? part would be to discover how many non-virologists became virologists as a result um, of funding. <laughs> totally. I can tell you here, there are plenty of them. Uh, one Everybody's of my, a coronavirologist I mean, now. Yes. <laughs> one of my favorite is this idea that which can only come from a non-virologist that ACE2 is all that matters. If you have ACE2, yeah, it's going to get infected. You know, There's nothing beyond ACE2. I mean, that's typical, right? Um, but I, I, I want to talk about your science now. We could go on with this angle for a long time, I think. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> but I want to hear about uh, immunity 
and so you've been you've been publishing papers on immunity at different times after in, infection. So give us the overview. Let's start with antibodies and B cells. Um, talk about the development of a B cell response in, say, asymptomatic, mild, and severe COVID. What do we know? I don't know if we know a lot about severe, at least based on what we have done, not the a review of the okay. entire literature. No, what you have done, yeah. Um, so mostly we've worked with various cohorts either uh, here in New York with Rockefeller and the New York Blood Center or NHS in Scotland. And uh, But it's mainly asymptomatic to mild, moderate. Now, no, the majority were not uh, severe disease. We did have a very early collaboration where that included some severe patients. And then, of course, what you see overall is a very variable um, antibody response uh, in terms of levels of neutralizing antibodies between people. You have about 10% uh, of people that have what we would call a good neutralization titer in their, in their serum plasma and 20% uh, that are completely undetectable in our assay. So they appear to have uh, very little, if any, neutralizing antibodies. And then the majority are spread and from low to modest uh, levels, but highly, really, really big differences between the people. And we see that with the natural infection and vaccination, I would say in the recent uh, preprint also. But regardless of the level, the overall neutralizing activity in the plasma, each person does have appear to have some ability to make very potent neutralizing antibodies. So when you isolate ant individual antibodies from these people, you can obtain some really um, powerful, I want to say potent, but no, don't like the word, but they neutralize very well. I don't like Regardless robust. That's the word I don't like. Robust. Robust. <laughs> and robust. Oh, it's robust. Yes. <laughs> Uh, you could get some really potent antibodies regardless of what the overall neutralization of that plasma is. So it, we can make them, it's just how much of them you make after infection that appears to affect. So you, you see a lot of variability even in people who've gotten um, vaccinated, right? Yeah. The, the variation's clearly less in okay. vaccine recipients. Um, and, you know, it's probably under the the basis for that variation is probably in large part um, just really the amount of antigen to which the immune system's been exposed, which is generally speaking more consistent with an intramuscular injection than, uh, you know, an infection that might stay in the nose, might go down into the lung. Just the, the, the biological variability in natural infection, I think, is just significantly greater. Um, than vaccination. What's what's been interesting and also quite important is that uh, when when as Theodora says you start to drill down and look at individual antibodies, and that that's really sort of been I think the strength of the collaboration here between our groups and Michelle's group, who really can clone these antibodies at very high throughput. Um, what you find is that different individuals, whether they've been infected or whether they've been vaccinated, um, some of those antibodies are nearly identical in those individuals. And they start off being really quite close to what we call germline. You know, a naive B cell gets stimulated, it proliferates, it, it starts to make antibody, and there's this process of somatic mutation that that refines and improves the antibodies. What, what turns out to be the case in SARS-CoV-2 is you don't have to get very far away from the germline to get very potent antibodies. And that, that's at least in part because some of the germline sequence already provides a good interface with the, with the spike protein. Um, and that, that's really why it's quite straightforward to, to generate these very potent antibodies with, with, um, with, uh, you know, with vaccination. But um, the other thing that has become quite interesting and, and important is that the antibodies themselves evolve. Right. So the more antigen that the B cells are exposed to, then you get more and more somatic mutation. And what, what we found um, 
by examining those more mature, more evolved antibodies is they, they tend to be more potent. Uh, they tend to have greater breadth uh, in terms of being somewhat resilient to the, the types of escape mutations that we've, we've heard being talked about um, recently. So um, antibodies that, that, have, that have experienced a lot of um, evolution, um, they're not only more potent, but they're also more resilient. And that, I think that's pretty important when you think about some of the policies that have been talked about with regard to, to vaccination and, and how we might think about how the pandemic will evolve um, and how the population immunity um, will evolve. There's uh, there's something I'm not I, I'm unclear on here, maybe misunderstanding. You describe uh, individuals who have definitely had uh, had the disease. They've tested positive. They may or may not be symptomatic, and yet if you uh, look at their serum with one of your sort of standard neutralization assays, their neutralization titer is undetectable. Is that correct? Correct. And yet I, I'm getting the impression that at the same time that if you really drill down into those individuals, you can find that there are antibodies there that uh, are good antibodies. OK, I wanted to make sure uh, I was clear on that. So those individuals, even though in your laboratory uh, neutralization test, you cannot detect uh, uh, neutralization activity, they, uh, their immune status is still probably OK. Where, where I'm where I'm going with this is I'm wondering after all this experience what your perspective is on correlates of protection. I was getting to that too. <laughs> right. So, so obviously the the knowledge base here is evolving, right? But I I think it's pretty pretty clear and pretty likely that your chances of being reinfected are very much greater if you have a, a zero neutralization titer compared to if you have a, a titer of 10 or 20,000. Um, so uh, wh when we say um, zero neutralization titer, we don't really mean zero. It means sort of a, towards the bottom end of the range that we can measure in our in our assay, okay? Or, uh, and... The, the levels of sensitivity in various neutralization assays are not uniform. So what's undetectable in one assay will be low in another assay. It, it, it's almost certainly not the case that, that there are people with zero neutralizing. Yeah, I deliberately use the word undetectable. Right. right. Um, but, but what we also know is that um, once virus has been cleared, there's, there's, a, there's a decline, right? But if you're declining from 20,000, you know, it's going to take a lot longer, maybe many, many years before your titers have declined to, say, one in four, one in two. And, and what that threshold is that allows you to be reinfected and what that what those numbers mean in terms of not just the antibodies themselves, but the memory B cells and the memory T cells that have also been stimulated along with those antibodies, what that means in terms of subsequent disease severity, ability to transmit, um, uh, boosting of that immune response to a, a more respectable level. Those are, those are just things that, I, you know, we can make reasonable prediction, mm -hmm. but we kind of just have to wait and see. Okay. Um, well, it's, it's also interesting that you see some variability in the vaccinated individuals in neutralizing titers. Um, and yet we now have clinical trials showing really impressive efficacy of these vaccines, suggesting that maybe even within that variability, yeah. the immunity is still there. So, so I, Against disease. Which yeah. Against disease, right. She's, That's what the trials have looked at. Right. So this, it's, this there's almost the nobody of whether, whether immunity is going to be sterilizing with either infection or yeah. vaccine. So in the vaccinated population, there, there's very few, almost nobody who has undetectable levels okay. of neutralizing antibody. It's, you know, you if you have, um, you know, a wide range from undetectable to extremely high in the, 
infected population, the 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 range in yeah, the vaccinated right. population is sort of in the medium to high range, I would say. Right. Which speaks again to your idea that the course of an infection is highly variable, whereas uh, an immunization is a much more controlled uh, uh, exposure. Is that Correct. true in general for viruses and viral vaccines? This idea that uh, the infection is going to be more variable? You know, I mean, I think you guys are just as well placed to answer that as us. I mean, we 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 know well, I know about HIV and I know about SARS-CoV-2, but you know, poliovirus, I I defer to your expertise on that. Vincent and um, pox viruses. Uh, I, I think Rich would be better placed to answer that the, the, yeah, than yeah. I. I agree. Um, I think it varies on a virus by virus basis. I think for polio, natural immunity and, and vaccine immunity are are both very strong and, and long lived. But uh, I also think it has to do not just with the uniformity of infection, but how what kind of antagonists, immune antagonists, are encoded in the genome, right? So yes. Right. Yes. And th there's strong suspicion that SARS-CoV-2 messes around with yeah, the immune system sure. in ways that sure. are being discovered. So the and do you do you have any sense of I know you maybe haven't looked at this directly yourselves, but um, what role might cellular immunity mm -hmm. been play, be playing in this whole process? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it probably play, plays a role. I get that answer a lot when I ask that yeah. question. Yeah. Is that a meh? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not a meh. I don't think so. So the the I mean the issue the issue is it's just so much easier experimentally <laughs> yes. to demonst demonstrate the protective power of antibodies. You can just take plasma from one animal, put it in another, or from one human and put it in another. Or you can put monoclonal antibodies in animals and humans and right. and show for sure that they have protective efficacy. And we can measure them pretty accurately yes. and quantitatively. You know, those those things are just way more difficult with T cells, and you really have to be doing experiments in you know um, in mice um, where you can transplant cells from one immunized animal to another. Um, I don't even know that those experiments have actually been done with SARS-CoV-2 in there's, mice. There's one actual um, epidemiology study that I'm aware of where um, it was done in the UK where they worked with the NHS and they set us one of the big issues in T cells, I gather, is just standardizing the assay yes. because it's more complicated to look at and every lab does it differently. And so, you know, you get all these different publications. They don't necessarily... You can't compare them, um, but there was at least one experiment done, and I don't have the reference handy, but um, they looked at um, T cell responses in a population of healthcare workers. I think it was in the UK um, using standardized methods and looking at a fairly large population of them. And they there was a clear correlation between the strength of a T cell response and whether people got reinfected after. The, right. so looking at healthcare workers who got infected, what were their odds of getting reinfected? And the stronger T cell responses seemed to correlate with better protection. But I, but I'll, I'll again, bet you'd, have to, um, you'd have to do the mouse studies to get at mechanistic yeah. details here. And I'll bet their antibody titers correlated too. Their because the T cells I, and the antibodies yeah, correlate I, with you, each other. Yes. So it's, it's really, really very tough. You know, we're beginning to think about doing experiments in, um, B cell deficient mice, T cell deficient mice, but you, you always run into the objection that's a mouse, right? And I'm certain I've heard you guys say Wait, yes. mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. <laughs> so, <laughs> For sure. So unless yeah. you unless you and have a cohort, people, but we it is it is a lot of human <laughs> twins who'd be willing to swap <laughs> T cells and be experimentally uh, infected, mm. then it, it, there's going to be uncertainty. Yeah. Um, right. right. Can you uh, tell us about memory B cells? You had a recent paper on, uh, which says they persist for up to six months uh, after infection. Um, is so we don't know longer, right? That's as far as we can go. We for now, yes, we are gonna. Actually, we are. This is an ongoing um, project, so we're about to get the. 
uh, cohort back for the one year visit. So we'll know, we'll follow them to see what happens over time, obviously, because this is, I think, an interesting question. And yes, uh, B cells do persist. And as Paul uh, m- um, mentioned earlier, we do see also maturation and we do see evolution of the antibodies themselves. We can see, find the, what happened to the antibody over time. And at least after natural infection, there is some, uh, uh, there appears to be some antibody evolution. Now, what's driving it is a different question, but uh, we, yeah, we don't know. And we don't, we see it and we don't know whether that's what happens when a person is vaccinated rather than naturally infected, whether the same maturation goes on and whether what happens before and after the second dose and, with yeah. some of the vaccines, different questions, but uh, those are things that, it, yeah, we it's still ongoing. So, and those studies, of course, are going to be confounded by vaccination, right? So we yes. can't ask ask our convalescent cohort to forego <laughs> vaccinations so that we can study how long their T, their T and B cells last. Um, Finally, a role for anti-vaxxers. <laughs> <laughs> you, you they know, generally don't volunteer, though. No, no, right. they don't. No, they in don't. this uh, in the manuscript, uh, evolution of antibody immunity. I mean, is it correct? You 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 find viral RNA in the intestine, and you're suggesting that it's persistent. Maybe may be involved with the memory B cell persistence. Is that what what I'm understanding? Yes, that's correct. And that's that's really the work of Saurabh Mahandru at, at Mount Sinai. So he's a, a gastroenterologist and he he you know spends a fair fair fraction of his time um, with uh, endoscopes taking samples from uh, from individuals' intestines. And it, it's pretty clear that um, three months or so after people have had their their you know, few week encounter with SARS-CoV-2, it, he can find antigen positive cells in the in the gut epithelia. You know, it's it's patchy and it's not uniform and it's not everybody, but he could could certainly find RNA, certainly find antigen positive cells. And Pamela Bjorkman um, looked in the EM and could find viral particles. Um, the final version of the paper doesn't contain those uh, those pictures because there was some back and forth between Pamela and the reviewer, and the reviewer always gets the last word, so those images didn't make it into the the final version of the paper. But Pamela's pretty experienced at looking at these things, and uh, she thinks she can see virions in these samples collected some months after. Uh, individuals have been infected and, and have been PCR negative on swab for, for some time. And you can't isolate infectious virus from those samples or from stool. So it's hard to say can't because how hard do you have to try before you say can't? Right. right? right. Um, but it has and been as, a, as I say, it's very patchy and non-uniform Um and it, there are there are legitimate technical reasons why that would be extremely difficult. Sure. Has so anyone- the, gut, the gut tissue where you're finding RNA and antigen, uh, are you confident that that's like epithelial tissue or is it gut lymphoid tissue? Or can you discriminate between the two? Lemon appropriate. No, the, these are clearly epithelial cells. Okay. They're, and they're ACE2 positive. Yes. Um, so, Vincent, they have ACE2. Positive. So <laughs> that's it. It's all you need to know. That's all you need. That's it. So, uh, Dixon, one second. Any, one second. Okay, so you go ahead. Has go ahead, anyone go. got infectious virus from feces? Do you know? It's my my understanding that is there has been one or two reports of that, but in general, it's pretty tough. Okay. There's a lot of RNA, but not much... Well, but there's it's been hard I mean, to isolate early, early in infection. People have managed yeah. to isolate infectious virus from feces, haven't they? Yes. No, it's just RNA. Because no, I know there's no, there no, are sewage no, monitoring efforts going on. But that's yeah, just but that's RNA. PCR. Monitoring. Just RNA. It's PCR. PCR. Nobody's nobody's actually gotten infectious virus from feces. I, I no, I, I don't think it's true that no one has. It's mm. certainly not routinely done, and that there have been correspondingly few. Re- 
reports of it. I mean, the, the lumen of the gut's a pretty hostile environment. It's not, it's not really conducive to finding infectious virus, but that in no way says that the gut lining isn't infected. Right. right? We, know, we know there's a ton of HIV in gut lymphoid tissue, but good luck trying to isolate HIV from stool. It's, mm-hmm. you know, it's just not, not, yeah. not straightforward. Now we have a newfound um, respect for poliovirus, which is abundantly in feces. Uh-huh. Yeah, which, yeah. So I have a question related to the um, natural route of infection and the induction of immunity, because this obviously is an inhaled virus, and then it spreads through the oral cavity, the anterior oral, oral cavity to the lungs, et cetera. Has anyone uh, done any, uh, I wouldn't say preclinical trials, but with human volunteers to see what the efficacy would be for the same vaccine as a, as a mist, like flu mist? So I don't think anyone's done that particularly, but I, I know there's a paper from Mike Mike Diamond's group where they I think they gave the um, the Chadox vaccine intramuscularly and intranasally. Um, mm. My recollection of that paper isn't perfect, but my understanding was that it really did work better given uh, given as a mucosal vaccine than as an intramuscular vaccine. Yeah, I mean, I could see it as, a, as an, in an inhaler. An inhaler. In That's, yeah. I, oh, it was better in my than it was... In uh, mice. Oh, in, in mice. mice. In mice. 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 Well, they don't care. So, so uh, Paul and Theodora, we, we've hit an hour. Can we stay a little more? Is it okay with you? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. All right. I have not scheduled anything else this afternoon. Very good. And it's Friday. <laughs> um, can we talk a bit about, you've done a lot of work with uh, variants escaping from uh, antibody monoclonals in particular, a big e-life paper where you looked at many. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um so right now there are a number of uh, variants circulating that have spike changes that will um, impinge on monoclonal neutralization. Correct? Yes, indeed. And are those have those always circulated since the beginning of the outbreak? Yes, or no? I, I'm asking. At you. extreme, yes. You, if you look at the GISAGE all the way back in uh, the database, all the way back in late spring, you see some of them but they're at extremely low frequency. We're talking one, I don't know, 10,000, 100,000 sequences. It was really low, but it was there. It was already there. So they did not arise now. They have been arising over time, but they didn't have, let's say, there was no selective pressure at the time. So you found them very, very um, rarely. Now, the people, a lot of people have been infected already. They have antibodies. There is more selective pressure. So the mutations that confer resistance to these to particular antibodies have are encouraged or like take over because they are they escape. They allow the virus to escape, at least from certain antibodies, not from everything. But okay. So yeah. we're gonna say something, Paul. Go ahead. Well, I mean, from, from very early early in the pandemic, I mean, as soon as we were making these therapeutic uh, monoclonal antibodies, we were very interested in understanding um, resistance. And so we, we knew that E484K, for example, the mutation that's on everyone's lips these days, we, we've known for months that that's an antibody uh, escape mutation. Um, but as Theodora says, it... it in the absence of selection pressure, it just maintained it uh, at a at a low level, and so th- there's something of a debate at the moment of, about whether these um, variants have been selected for improved transmissibility or escape from neutralizing antibodies. And you know, for us, it's pretty clear if you if you just um, take a a whole set of monoclonal antibodies. Um, and put them one at a time against, uh, uh, you know, a replicating virus. We use a, a VSV that has a SARS-CoV-2 envelope that very nicely recapitulates the neutralization properties of the authentic virus. We 
take 17 of the most potent antibodies from, uh, say, a vaccinated cohort. But they're, they're basically the same antibodies that you'd find in a convalescent cohort. You know, 14 of those 17 antibodies select at K417, at E484, and at N501. And so to us, that you, it doesn't get much closer to a smoking gun in terms of pinning the selective pressure on antibodies than that. Now, of course, when you when you do the, the experiments in a in a in a plasma, say, where there are many different kinds of antibodies, um, there are there's a lot of antibodies masking the effects of the individual antibodies because there are so many neutralizing epitopes. And so when you do a selection experiment like that, it it's it becomes more, more difficult to discern what individual antibody selection selection pressure looks like. But nevertheless, you know, if you do enough plasmas, um, you can find there's a lot of variation between plasmas. And some plasmas almost look like they're solutions of monoclonal antibodies. And we'll select E484K, for example, uh, and other, other positions. So... So for us, it's it's pretty clear that a lot of these mutations, substitutions have arisen recently as a result of antibody selection pressure. If it was really improved transmissibility that was driving selection, why didn't they happen six months ago? They right? were there. They were there. Um, we could met, we could see them, but they didn't they didn't rise to the surface. Um, so, I mean, that's our perspective on what's driving the selection. It, it could absolutely be possible that that what goes along with this selection pressure is 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 improved transmissibility as as a as a consequence of this this antibody selection. But it's very hard to pass those two things apart when you're looking at populations where the level of immunity is is steadily increasing because the virus is spreading there are more people with antibodies so what what does an, an r of one in a naive population look like in a um, partly mm. partly immunized population and what's the difference going to be if the virus has some some mutations that confer immunity to some of the antibodies in that population. I think it's going to be quite difficult to, to understand how these differences play out in populations. But it, in, the, in the test tube, it's blindingly obvious to us that um, antibodies select for the mutations that we're seeing arise in nature. Now, in the discussion of these, of these variants, um, some of the experiments that have been done have obviously been looking at um, post-vaccine serum or convalescent serum versus these variants and what are your neutralization you see uh, for some of the some of them there's a little reduction in neutralization but it still looks like it's able probably going to be able to neutralize and I'm wondering if maybe what we're seeing is the early stages of the virus evolving toward like it can't quite bypass immunity yet but that process is underway and maybe we're watching it happen because we're looking so closely? Obviously, yes. Agreed. Okay. So there are, as you said, the effect in the majority of the plasma that we've looked, whether it's from natural infection or vaccination, the effect is small. It's there because they all kind of dip, right. but it's small. And then, But you do have individuals where the effect is a lot more pronounced. They are, at least in our uh, cohorts, more rare but you can get a significant uh, decrease in neutralization uh, uh, ability against those uh, variants. But I think the, you're right. You're exactly right. It's, this is what happens now. And these are the mutations at least. And we have to also stress that we are looking at the RBD exclusively at the moment. We have not looked at, at mutations outside the RBD. And we know that there are antibodies targeting other regions of the spike. Just so happens that RBD is the best target. They're the most potent antibodies. But, um, and if the virus can escape a, a certain antibodies that target that, and then it allows to re replicate and reproduce in presence of other antibodies, then obviously the, the threshold for 
the virus to acquire more resistance is lower because you have right. less antibodies to <clears throat> it faces less antibodies and then iterative cycles of selection will p- potentially produce a completely resistant virus right. that's doom scena- uh, doomsday scenario but that doesn't, well, that doesn't or, even- or just seasonal coronavirus scenario right i mean i don't think anybody's looked in this detail at the yeah that's right at oc43 or at any of the other <clears throat> the seasonal cold coronaviruses that all of us get every few years right so, well, they, they so have, that, yeah. that has has been something that hasn't been looked at very closely until recently. But mm-hmm. there are there are a couple of studies now that have have sort of gone back to historic plasma, right. we, historic yeah. virus strains, and you can you can clearly see this sort of antigenic drift right. going on. But but it, the studies that I've looked at tend to suggest it's over many years. Right. Okay. So what's going to happen with SARS-CoV-2? There's a pretty good chance that it'll follow that. Um, paradigm, but um, we don't really know because this is a, a new virus in a new naive population. It could be that there's quite rapid evolution as immunity ramps in, and then you know five, ten years from now, we're we're into the seasonal coronavirus um, uh, type type of uh, scenario. Yeah, that's I mean, a, an important perspective in that the introduction of the virus into a naive population uh, until the population gains some sort of, uh, you know, uh, population wide immunity, that's going to have a likely a quite a different dynamic than the circulation of the virus in a, in a population that has some immunity. A great um, example of that is the West Nile virus when it was introduced into the United States in 1999. Every uh, crow was dying, every blue jay, a lot of robins, of course, uh, people too, but, uh, and seasonally up and down and up and down. Look today, I mean, you can hardly find a, a non resistant crow. Mm-hmm. It's amazing you know, the, how nature accommodates for these introductions like this. And it's a naturalized citizen of the United States now rather than an invader from the West. Right. So, uh, uh, but, but you have to stress a lot of birds died. Yeah. I mean, we're not yeah. going to let oh, <laughs> yes. Enormous numbers have died. Yes, enormous. and many, many people will die too and have yeah. died. Uh, so that's can, because the birds didn't have flexibility in their grant funding mechanism. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is all true. This is all true. So can you take select take your selection scheme, and you you select you you can can you select for resistance to convalescence or yes you said some seer are basically monoclonal right, and then keep well, tra- so so that that's that's a slight exaggeration sort of the 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 most monoclonal like plasmas that we've investigated you, you you select a virus in that plasma you can get a single amino acid change that will give 50 sometimes 100 fold a difference in in um, what we call nt50 the titer of neutralizing uh antibody there's a Almost always a, a residual level of neutralization, even even to those those um, even in those plasmas that look like they're dominated by uh, individual monoclonal antibodies. Right. So uh, far more frequently, what we find is you you you'll select select a mutant, and it'll give you know a small shift in in neutralizing titer. But then now what we're doing is to combine those mutations yeah. into individual spikes, sort of mimicking the natural experiment, but doing the experiment with what yeah. we select in, in the laboratory. And then you start to see large shifts in, sure, in, sure. The, in the neutralizing titer. And we're, we're sort of trying to use this to figure out exactly how many different types of neutralizing epitopes there are on the spike. Mm-hmm. Um, oh. How that's going to play out over time, you know, we just don't know. What what's it? What's the outcome going to be for somebody who has, um, who gets infected with a virus to which they have good neutralizing antibodies to say five out of the ten um, most important neutralizing epitopes? Is that going to be a mild asymptomatic infection? Um, I, I I think more and more just watching how things play out we're quite likely to get to a, a situation that we currently have with the common coronaviruses where it's, it's, you know, you either get infected or vaccinated early in life. And then as you go through life, you'll, you'll experience 
uh, infection by a virus that's partly but not completely resistant to your immunity. And as you go through life, you'll build up immunity. So by the time you get to an age where it will be really dangerous, you've have you've seen it so many times that you're quite well protected. So along those same lines, I've uh, uh, wondered, you know, following on that model, I've wondered whether uh, vaccination will become unnecessary. That's, I guess that that's, that's hard to predict because it's going to depend on how common the virus is, how pathogenic it is in newborns or, or infants. Um, and I think in this case, it's fairly non-pathogenic, um, not, not absent pathogenic, but, um, and then because for this scenario to play out, you do have to experience reinfection, mm -hmm. right? If we're so successful with vaccination that we knock the prevalence down to extraordinarily low levels, then we're going to have to keep our foot on the pedal with vaccination. Um, hard, hard to see how that's going to play out. Remember, the kids are, the babies are going to be protected by maternal antibodies for, you know, six months or whatever. And then maybe it, beyond that, it's not a, a problem, at least with the common cold coronas. Uh, it's not. Um, so I, I want to know. So I think we can learn from influenza, right, where there's gradual drift every year. And it any particular uh, subtype doesn't become resistant to neutralization. It just drifts. And if you get more than a one in four change in neutralization title, they change the vaccine. Right. And so we don't know what would happen if we just let it drift, but I'm not aware of any completely escaping. The only ones that do that are the reassortants that completely escape immunity. So maybe that happens. And maybe part of the issue is you you can only um, sustain so many mutations, amino acid changes that give you resistance, and then you start to lose fitness and those viruses can't survive, right? I mean, yes. you yeah, must have thought- I'm, I'm sort of skeptical of that model because, you know, that there's a lot of flexibility in the in the in the spike protein i mean you look at um you know there are look at sars cov itself for example there is some degree of immunolo immunological cross reactivity between sars cov2 and sars cov the original itself but um, that virus maintains the ability to use ace2 maintains fitness um Almost certainly SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV had a common ancestor at some point in the past. And they've they've drifted apart, perhaps driven by in part by immune selection in bats. Um, you know, we obviously don't know, we can't look so far back in history, but I I'm I'm not very persuaded by the argument that um that the, the degree to which the virus can drift in response to antibody pressure is limited by anything in particular. But well, remember, other viruses are limited, right? Measles and polio and are right. others. Right. Um, so right. it's not but, unprecedented. But, yes, but then look at HIV, yeah. right? You take antibody and virus from one person at one time point, <laughs> yes. that virus is already resistant to the antibodies in that yeah. individual. Okay. Well, or for that matter, look at coronaviruses. You look, the common cold coronaviruses, there certainly there are constraints on the spike protein, right? But they're flexible enough that they can continue to change and change and get past enough immunity to continue to circulate. Sure. And that's kind of, if you will, that's the coronavirus model as far as we can tell yeah. is that you've got, you've got enough evolutionary space to explore that you don't yeah. run out of hosts before more hosts are born. But with the coronaviruses, it's also the, the waning of immunity, not right. just escaping of immunity that's right. pretty important in reinfection, I think. So uh, going back to your idea that now there is immune selection, which is uh, rising the frequency of these variants. So I like that, but someone has suggested um, that they arose in an immunosuppressed patient who was given, so some of these patients are given monoclonal therapy and then after it wanes, they, they get reinfected or their virus is just hiding and it just comes back. And so they have long-term, many, many months, and that provides great opportunity for selection. I guess that could contribute to it, right? 
Of yeah. course, yes, yeah. that that could happen, but also reinfection. I mean, reinfection of a of a person whose immunity has waned is essentially the same thing, right? You have a few antibodies or low levels of antibodies, and the virus can uh, propagate in their presence and acquire the uh, mutations that are required to confer resistance. And uh, so also, or for example, convalescent plasma treatment with from donors that had really low levels of neutralizing antibodies to begin with, because we know that the cutoff used for selection of uh, convalescent plasma donors was not very stringent in terms of neutralizing antibodies. It was based on antibody levels as detected by a an assay, binding assay, but that does not reflect neutralization. Why was that so, done? Doesn't that, isn't that a bad idea? Of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> but it's what people had. I think yeah. a lot of a lot of people were were objecting at the time, but I mean, desperate times calls for desperate measures. The problem, I think, the the real question here is, yes, I agree with. Let's just try and do everything we can. But let's not do things that help the virus escape and give the virus an even better chance of uh, escaping from every uh, vaccines in particular is uh, a problem because then we are basically shooting us shooting ourselves in the foot. So yeah. does anybody have a good explanation as to why the immunity is rather short lived? Because of other virus infections, even in other antigen systems like tetanus or uh, oh, immunity lots of to the what, other Dixon? immunization protocols, yellow fever. I mean, those things last forever almost, But right? Dixon, so, immunity to what? Which virus are you talking about? The coronavirus, the coronavirus SARS cov well, why do you, But why do you say it's short-lived? They just told us it lasts at least six months, right? That's not a long time. Well, but that's, but we only, don't that's not a long time. It, Dixon, Dixon, <laughs> it might last 30 years. Yeah, we don't know. We haven't we looked. But you know. already said, Alan, that most coronaviruses but, don't last okay, very so, long. Right. So, so I'm, looking at the, I'm using your wisdom in this argument here. Don't, 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 don't so go back out of this. Right, but we can't use SARS-CoV-2 <laughs> as an example of that because we don't have the track record with it. So, But if we look at the common cold coronavirus. Yeah, that's what I'm going waning immunity and the immunity is all directed against the spike in those viruses and particles too is that correct just answer yes or no. is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so but paul i have to say i used to think that common cold immunity waned and then shane crotty yeah. said it actually doesn't and it's not been studied all that much so maybe it's not a matter of waning but antigenic drift because according to jesse bloom you know every eight years the Sierra doesn't recognize the virus from eight years ago, right? So maybe that's what's yeah. involved. I, I mean, ultimately, it, it it's probably a bit of a combination of both, right? If you if you you know six months after having been infected with two twenty nine e of a particular sequence, you encounter that identical strain, um, I would posit that your chances of being reinfected would be somewhat reduced perhaps not absent, but reduced compared to if you if you encountered a 229E strain that was, has been circulating on the opposite side of the world and is and it's a little different. Um, so it, it, it almost has to be some combination of drift and, and waning. Um, uh, uh, what the magnitude of contribution of each of those things is, uh, not completely sure. And of course, uh, it's it's very likely that the, that even that partial immunity, if you get reinfected, contributes to making the disease milder in right. subsequent exposures. So w w when we talk about waning, we're, we mean the loss of memory B cells, right? Uh, not only that. No, I, at least in our minds, it's both because the, the memory B cells are there. We, we know that they're, they're at least six months out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but also the uh, neutralizing antibodies themselves. So waning, that we we've shown that sure, they sure. go down over time. So they don't. Uh, but what matters out. is memory B cells because it doesn't matter if you have a one to two serum titer. If you've got some memory B cells, they're going to respond immediately, right, and protect you presumably. Well, what do you mean by immediately? Well, it won't um, take it won't take two to three weeks to get a response it will take no, days but right? it might take several days and yeah. you think that in SARS-CoV-2 viremia is peaking in those few days anyway so 
So if you, if you had a lot of memory B cells but zero circulating antibody, what, what what's okay. the effect yeah. of those memory B cells going to be on the trajectory of viremia? You know, I not not sure that it's going to have yeah. much effect in the first two or three days, right? Unless they're mucosal. Uh, and their B cell memory B cells in the mucosa, right? There are some, and they can respond more, more quickly. But well, still, a few days. You're right. It's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I, I must confess, I'm on a little thin ice here, speculating yeah. about this. That's I'm, fine. I, I'm not not sure it's entirely possible to completely divorce circulating antibody from memory B cell levels. Yeah, well, well another possibility we could use is, right now. <laughs> right. Another yeah. another possibility yeah. though is even if you. Even if you're relying on a memory B cell response, it takes a few days to get into gear. You yeah. still have the okay. viremia. You still get the virus. You get some symptoms. But yeah. it's possible, and I don't know if we know enough about the late phase cytokine storm that we're looking at, that maybe if this is coming from memory B cells, you'd be less likely to develop that severe disease that we see that's not primarily viral driven. Yes. Yeah. Quite possibly. Yeah. So it's also possible that... The immune system is so efficient at wiping this virus out soon after we acquire it that the antigen stimulation is so brief that that's maybe the reason why immunity fades after a while. Because mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, if you could work out a way of making a depot of multiple spikes with all these changes that you've been talking about uh, and have it slow release for over six months, I'd probably have a lifetime immunity as a result of something like that. But that's yeah. not what goes on in nature. Yeah, funny you should mention that. One of the things we put in our proposal to generate broad breadth, neutralizing breadth, is is sort of extended extended antigen exposure types of vaccines, um, yeah. with the idea yeah. of generating That's antibodies right. That's right. and memory B cells that have have lots of somatic mutation. Sure. So, what sort of platform gives you extended antigen exposure? Alum. <laughs> <laughs> well, what one we are thinking about is AAV. Okay, so okay. so we know if you put a, a AAV expressing GFP into a mouse muscle, a year later that muscle's still bright green. Yep. Okay, um, so that that you know that's one of the trick. Uh, you know whether whether AAV is going to be a, a vaccine vector that. I understand there are some safety concerns about it. <laughs> we're we're going to genetically modify just a few of your cells to continuously yeah. express a virus. Not only that, you're going to glow in the dark for the rest of your yeah. life. <laughs> but, it, but it's an experimental tool to explore the limits yes. of how prolonged yeah, antigen right. exposure right. might right. generate um, somatic mutation-induced breadth. That's, uh, that's could you run into problems with tolerance if you do something like that? Mm, I, well, you're at the limits of my knowledge of immunology, <laughs> I'm afraid. Well, I'm beyond, I'm beyond my limits here. I'm we went into the weeds out. a long time ago yeah. for the rest That's of us. Okay. Every <laughs> time you think about waning okay. immunity, um, I mean, at least in terms of my experience with parasites, is that that's the malaria story. Every single year in an intermittently transmitted zone, the people reacquire malaria. Same, same parasite, same everything, and the immunity lasts for a little while, and then it dissipates, and then it's gone, and then next year there's another epidemic, and then they get it again. Only, only they can fight it off better, but there's still some residual effect, especially if it's Plasmodium falciparum, because it's, there's some brain damage that occurs every time you're infected. So, there's a price to pay for every turn you take in nature. And so I wondered what the price would be to pay for a longer exposure to uh, SARS-CoV-2, a less pathogenic form, of course, and, uh, and a long-term immunity uh, reward. Maybe clotting effects that'll occur when you're 90 before, the, <laughs> I don't know, but uh, you, you always think of um, what does what does nature do, and then can we imitate that rather than what can we outdo nature for? Hmm. Yeah, I, um, I'm I'm just not sure that that calls for a That's bit fine. too much speculation on my part. I think. Can I? Can well, I, ask I know there are there are um, vaccine platforms where you express the gene in tobacco. Maybe you could have a snuff product that people just repeatedly <laughs> dose themselves with. Remember, Alan, they were going to do the bananas. That was Hillary Kaprowski's yes, idea. Bananas. That's right. He wanted right. to put them in bananas. They did it. Didn't they do hepatitis virus? That B, B, I think. Protein. Yeah. yeah, they did the protein. Uh, yeah, so, guys, it. what? So, Moderna said they're going to make a B1.35 uh, mRNA vaccine. 
The 351. Three, yes. Whatever. I'm trying okay. to not mention the country where it originated. Right. I, so I've started what? referring to them as, as 117 and 351. I don't know if that's going to catch on, but that's those are because I don't want to say UK and well, South Africa. Yeah, because, because not, I'm from the we UK. We don't even know that's where they say. Okay. Right. The South African. Both have a, they both have a similar accent. So uh, Moderna, 351. Moderna is talking. Moderna about. said we're going to make an mRNA. It's going to be 1273 351. What you, is that a good idea? Do we need it? What do you think? Yeah. Who knows? I, mean, I don't know. Yeah. What what strains are going to be circulating two or three months from now? Um, exactly. By the time it's out, it's going to be a different variant that's going around. Maybe, yeah. Really? Maybe, that maybe quickly? That, will, that quickly? Well, look how quickly, the, well, I mean, I think it's important to bear in mind that on a, on a global level, these variant strains are still quite a small fraction of the, the global um, um uh, you know, diversity. So what, I mean, I get it is, it is um, quite suggestive that basically similar mutations, at least in the RBD are cropping up in different, different places in the world. So if you were betting on any mutations becoming dominant, then, then you'd, you'd certainly go with that. I think what's a little less predictable is our mutations in the NTD where, there are point substitutions and deletions. Um, and I, my impression is that the, the flexibility that the virus has to evade immunity in the NTD is a little, a little greater because these antibodies seem to be targeting sort of flexible floppy loops uh, on the outside of the, the NTD. So trying to get, get a strain match Right, um, in the NTD might be might be more challenging. It it might be less less predictable what's going to dominate um, based on that. So there, I don't recall all the mutations that are in, for example, the South African version of the K four one seven E four eight four N five zero one variant. They're basically the same mutations in the Br Brazilian um, strain, but I think they're different NTD mutations. So which do you go with when you're redesigning your vaccine? And, you know, if, if the worst happens and there are more mutations that occur in the RBD and the, um, the NTD, it, it's a, re a real problem to think about how often you need to update and what strain you go with. We, we, I think we're still, we're still going to be learning the rules with SARS-CoV-2 for a I think to a large a extent, while. we're going to end up, um, or, or what I'm presuming we'll do and kind of hoping we'll do is follow the epidemiological data on this. Because um, it's all well and good for, for people to look at the molecular changes that are going on, but the real question is, what is the practical impact of any of this? Um, and this is one of the things that's been lost in the are they more transmissible discussion. Um, you know, well, but still, if you're not going out to parties and such, you're not going to get it. Yet it's, it can't teleport through walls. So, um, so the question of, well, is it evading immunity? I think if it is, we should see evidence of that showing up and not just in one phase 2A trial that wasn't even powered for efficacy in South Africa. I mean, in actual data from vaccinated populations, are we now seeing more and more infections? Are they symptomatic enough for us to worry about? Um, do we need a new vaccine to adapt to these variants as they, if they spread? Um, and, and I think that will become clear. I think that'll declare itself. I think Moderna's decision was based on the fact that their Sierra from their phase one had a difficulty neutralizing the the South African was, variant. It had right? a, yeah, it had a slight. So they just um, decided, and it's re easy enough to yes. reprogram and do yeah, it. And I think right. I think the reason Moderna is doing this is, um, you know, for them it makes perfect sense. You've got an mRNA vaccine. One of the great strengths of it is if you've got a sequence, you can make a new vaccine. It's yeah. a major reason why we got these vaccines first. Yeah. Um, and so for Moderna, they can just go to the same system, say, okay, we got a sequence change. Let's do a sequence change, have that sitting there. Um, and then if it turns out that that's needed, 
then you can go ahead with um, sure. deploying it. Right. So, so if, if I'm getting immunized tomorrow, say, mm. I, w- I want the original strain. I don't want I, the South. Here, here. I yeah. want the original <laughs> flavor, yes. In fact, exactly. that's what I got. The, what you didn't say, or lo- I might have missed that, is if you line up these spike proteins and you've got huge numbers of sera now and you've got panels, how many total epitopes have you identified? Uh, uh-huh. Wait for our next paper. <laughs> No, I want to know now. <laughs> Data not shown. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Give us a ballpark figure here. <laughs> One that, or a thousand. <laughs> that's, no, it's not, it's not. that's really a work in process. And it really, really depends on how you define what a different <laughs> epitope is. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So if you look if you look at the RBD for for example. You, you can you can clearly subclassify the an- neutralizing antibodies that bind bind the RBD, but they're they're clearly overlap partly overlapping epitopes. Right. Um, so I mean the way we're approaching this is sort of function functionally. How many different amino acid substitutions can you come across that that provide a, a change in neutralization properties? And I have to say, we don't know at this point. It, oh, okay. I don't think it's going to be, um, it's not going to be thousands, yeah. but it's probably going to be more than 10. So, uh, if Sorry, you, that doesn't <laughs> narrow it down very much. But it's you okay. add a zero, you just add a zero. So if you take, <laughs> let's you take, a, you, you take a, a, one of your pseudotypes, you select for monoclonal resistance, and then... Yeah another monoclonal will still neutralize that. Is that two different mm-hmm. epitopes? Yes, yeah. usually yes. That's how you do when it, right? When they have two different, right, right, right. They, target, they target distinct epitopes okay. on, the, on the spike. Got it. And so, uh, what I would say is that when we first established the system and when we got the first study out, the eLife paper, and um, it, it, uh, because these variants had not appeared in s- such high numbers, it was... Uh, Unclear, even to me, whether how um, predictive, what the predictive power of this system was. And we knew that the mutations were present, that we were, the mutations we're looking at were already there at very, very low frequency. And then uh, uh, it was, I mean, so people were saying, well, do you really need to worry about them? They're so infrequent. Uh, but, and we felt, yeah, maybe this is a way, it's a good more assay to predict what's, go- not pre- predict what's going to happen, to see what's going to happen, what's going to drive change. And then when this variant started uh, circulating and we saw that they were exactly the same epitopes that we had identified, you're like, hey, we, we, we saw this. We saw this earlier. Yeah. And we were probably the first to, to test all these different mutants and their effect on individual antibodies and uh, plasma to some extent. And so it's it actually, in that respect, it was um, scientifically um, uh, yeah. gratifying, let's put it that way. So, so to Dixon's question about how many epitopes there are, I'm pretty sure that's going to be different for different plasmas, right? If if you want to know what the total number is, that that's going to be a very hard number to to get at. Right. I mean, and I was actually referring to natural sera that you collected from patients that had either been vaccinated or recovered, so that you know what at least what the what the limits are for change that you have to address if you're going to still have an effective vaccine. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's still a difficult question. I mean, with the there's, we certainly have one plasma where one amino acid change gives nearly complete resistance. So, ah. so um, there, are other, there are others where you introduce several changes with very small change in neutralizing titer. So, and some where it, it seems nearly impossible to select resistance. So that suggests very well ah. balanced. Oh, recognition okay. of multiple epitopes. So, sure. Sure. you know, there, there's clearly heterogeneity between individuals um, okay. and what, what that final number is. And what, you know, what, even when you have that number, what, what does that mean in terms of how often and how much you have to change the, the vaccine? 
Mm. That's those are those are tricky tricky questions to get at. at this there, there are also uh, there are also immunodominant epitopes, which you see more frequently targeted, and that's the case yeah. with influenza, right? The HA has clear immunodominant, and then others yeah. that are rare, right? So those those mutations that we've talked about, K four one seven, E four eight four, N five zero one, they're they're, they're clearly um, parts of the RBD that are are relatively frequently yeah. recognized by uh, antibodies in vaccines and infected individuals. Uh, Paul, uh, let's end up by um, asking you about this uh, essay you wrote called Musings of an Anonymous Pissed-Off Virologist. And you had originally put it on Twitter and then I posted it in Virology Blog. That just, uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of listeners haven't heard about it. So tell us about it. Yeah, well, this, I I wrote this, I think it was New Year's Day this year and it, it was... So with was, a headache. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I, I did have a little bit of a headache actually. <laughs> And it was it was sort of triggered by the the decision of the UK um, government authorities to um, to instead of give instead of giving two two doses of the mRNA vaccine as had been tested in the clinical trial to to basically spread spread out the doses and and give more people one dose and then. Um, um, delay the second dose for mm. up to three months, um, and it 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 sort of struck me that what 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 was being done here was had some parallels to what we were doing in the laboratory <laughs> in our attempt to generate antibody resistant virus. Right. So what we do in the lab is we generate large populations of virus. We grow it for a bit to make diversity, okay? <laughs> and then we mix it with various levels of antibody, okay? And then allow selection pressure to occur and then just see 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 what grows out. And just to reiterate, you're doing with this a pseudotyped virus. So we're not primary. you're not this actually primary generating virus. this in SARS CoV-2. You're Right. Yes, chimeric virus, not a chimeric virus. But, yeah. but the prince, the principle the is princi no, no, no. My point, my point was for anybody who's who maybe didn't tune into that part of the conversation. Say, <laughs> oh my God, they're making worse virus. No, no, no. <laughs> this one cannot get out. Of <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, this, this what we do in the lab is sort of a, a way to figure out what the right. antibodies are targeting. Right. How would how would you how would you get the virus to escape these antibodies? Yeah. It's antigenic drift in a dish. Yes, yeah. basically. And it it just struck me that 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 individual action, right, in the UK, on top of the last year of um, a catalogue of catastrophic errors on the part of government, media, society, in totally failing to control the spread and the generation of genetic diversity in SARS-CoV-2 in the natural population, um, it, the, the parallels just struck me. And honestly, um, I think for us personally, although this year has been, uh, we've had moments of reward and exhilaration in terms of the science that we've been doing, overall, it's been a pretty frustrating, stressful time watching how incompetently um, and poorly all of the above groups, society, media, politicians have handled this pandemic. And honestly, I was, I was really pretty angry when I, when I wrote that. Um, I intended just to show it to a few colleagues in the field because um, there's, there's a little bit of you know, technical knowledge required to to understand that. And I showed it to Theodora. She said, you should put it on Twitter. I said, oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, maybe I will, but I'll say it's anonymous. But it's kind of obviously not anonymous. And uh, that that was the genesis uh, of that. Actually, I, I so when I wrote it, I played the part of a um, nefarious conspirator. Right. Um, you know, basically outlining what I would do if I was um, a nefarious conspirator to generate a vaccine-resistant um, virus, 
Um, and it's basically what we've done. <laughs> it's it's funny though. Some some people on Twitter, that cesspool of uh, intellectual discourse, <laughs> actually thought I was, of course, positing that there had been a real conspiracy <laughs> to course. generate vaccine resistance strains. But of course, it's it's just a, a catalog of errors and incompetence. For so the than parallel that. is, well, I'm thinking of a couple of parallels. One is drug resistance that applying a little bit of selection yeah. is almost worse than applying none at all. That you, exactly. that if yes. you really want to uh, get after something, you have to go at it a hundred percent. Otherwise, if you're letting something uh, replicate a little bit in the, in the presence of some selective pressure, you're encouraging the uh, uh, emergence of resistant mutants. Actually, I have another for the listeners. Uh, something came to mind as you were talking, and that is the undisciplined kid that I see in the supermarket, you know, <laughs> where the mother says, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, but never follows up. Yeah. And the kid learns just to be a brat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I do, I do have to, I do have to say, because not everyone agrees with um, the point of view that I've expressed about, whether to whether or not to delay the second um, second vaccine dose, there are, there are good arguments on both sides. I, I just happen to think the arguments on one side are are more powerful, but there there is a, a legitimate point of view that says that sort of generating partial immunity in a larger number of people might be the best best way to go. And you know we have to say we at this point we just don't know. Right. You know? Yeah. It seems to me if you don't know, you should err on the safe side, right? Exactly. That's well, but a lot of the other a lot of the other points you make in the essay are less ambiguous. I mean, in terms of uh, of how closings and reopenings have been handled and and that sort of thing. Yeah, there's so, plenty well, of, uh, plenty of blame to go around yes. about how and also how in, we, the, in the in the presence of in the presence of uncertainty, you know, it seems like the the safe thing to do is to go with the program where you have data. Yeah. That says it'll work. That's right. Okay. But as you know, um, well, and, and Paul and Theodora, you know, our governor has decided he doesn't want to listen to the experts anymore, right? Yes. <laughs> it is really, it's really funny to to hear him say that when he criticized Trump about the same thing. But uh it was really but now he's behaving exactly like that. And it's just, yeah. Mind boggling. Let me too. ask you one more thing. Um, you, you have kids in, in the New York City school system, right? So what's this what's going on right now with schools? So elementary schools are open, but you will have to stress that it's a very small percentage of kids that are going, physically going. Most of them are doing remote. So I think under these conditions where it's I think about a third of the kids that are in class and not all together at two days, one group, another two days, another group. Under those circumstances and they're wearing masks and they're being careful. Yes, it's I think it's controlled. Even so, because we get notifications from our previous school, schools close periodically. So that when they find one or two uh, incidents and related, they close the school down. High schools and middle schools are closed and uh, completely. It's all remote. And uh, I think that's, I don't know. Again, when they were open, it was the same system. Only a, a percentage of kids were going and again in alternate days. So it, it appeared okay. But uh, I don't know what they're going to do uh, going forward. I mean, the New York City, don't get me started on the DOE of New York City because they're just... I try. Uh, I'm trying. <laughs> so, so are you? Are your your kids are attending remotely? They were always attending remotely. Right. They never went back, even when it was open partially. Even though I have to say, one kid is coping great, and the other kid is not coping good, well at all. She, it's really hard on them, and it's been really hard in the on the family. But even so, I think the uh, risk of getting SARS-CoV-2. Outweighs anything else. And How old my, my daughter, who came in to pet the cat, uh, is a ninth grader right now. So she's her first year of yeah. high school has been entirely remote, uh, and they're doing the same hybrid thing uh, in our district. Um, but she's been in the remote cohort yes. the whole time. Paul and Theodora, how old are your kids? 
eleven and thirteen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. it, it's a, it's been it's been a difficult difficult time, but this is one of one of those issues that has just been so frustrating to watch the debate play out in the media, mm-hmm. dominated by politics and not by um, really careful analysis of the the epidemiology and and public health message i mean it, it seems certain journalists take a position and they they'll find an expert that um agrees with that position and then write a story saying the schools are safe that's it's right. an occupational hazard yes <laughs> and right. of course right. the, the schools in new york city are quite safe because 90% of the kids are not going yeah <laughs> that's right, right. So when they say so they say that they say the best public health measures are the ones that no one is aware of, like putting fluoride in water and having food inspection because nobody really sees that happen. So but the, the moment it's up in front where everybody has to sort of buy into it because they have to participate to do something. That's when you start all these fractured opinions about what to do and the conspiracy theories and all kinds of crap. And it's just it's horrible. I I found it very interesting when they say here in New York, oh, we have no transmission in schools yet. (laughs) (laughs) That's because we don't have the schools open. (laughs) But it it is, yeah. The other thing that I think is overall frustrating, I can understand the people because I I feel it the same way. When the virus first came and we were put on lockdown, we said, okay, we will do it because we want to give the chance to the government to step up. Right. And find ways <laughs> to get the society working in some form so we can go back. And we, it's almost a year and we're still where we were before. Well, and you didn't is, have a government before that. That's the, that that's was, true, too. That is also <laughs> true. But some uh, certain yeah, local yeah. politicians, at least, pride themselves in being yeah, more right. competent than the previous administration. And this You're is right. just, to me, it's, it's a disaster. This is not a success. This totally is, agree. Totally agree. Totally yeah. Agree. I think we just have to look at how certain other countries in other hemispheres have handled the the pandemic and what level of viral infection they have. Meanwhile, we're close, closing in on half a million deaths in the United States alone. That's right. And all of all of these decisions, um, poorly formed opinions that get turned into policy. They all have a body count associated with them, here, here. and it's it's here, here. not a small number. It's it's been a catastrophe. To I be agree. frank, I agree. I agree. Um, guys, we're going to do some picks now. You want to stay and listen? You want to join? Sure. Them? Yeah, I didn't prepare any picks. I'm afraid, but That's we fine. will listen. Listen in. Uh, all right, Dixon, what do you have for us this week? You're muted. Last week, I I know I'm slower. I'm slower. Okay. Okay. So last week was a shout out to Alan. And this week is a shout out to uh, Rich. So Rich, I've got for you on the 18th of February, you and I are going to be glued to our television sets, watching the the, uh, Perseverance Mars rover actually land on the surface of Mars by a totally new approach to lowering larger and larger and larger vehicles on stranger and stranger and stranger places. And I watched the video of this. This is a great video, by the way, you have to watch it. It's, you can scroll down and minute by minute accounting of what's actually going to happen. They show you an animated feature, which is quite realistic. The way in which this lander is going to make its presence felt on the surface of Mars. So that's my pick for this week. Thank you, Dixon. This looks great. I will have a, I will, will have love a look this. at this. You will love this, this Rich. Great. It's, it's like being there. It's almost like being there. And this is the one that's carrying a helicopter, right? <laughs> this is true. <laughs> it's going to launch a little helicopter to this fly is true. on Mars. I, I think mean, that the, is the, so. the atmosphere is actually thick enough that you can right. do that. I, I yeah. was impressed, very oh. impressed. Amazing. Excellent. Nice. Cool. Good deal. Alan, Did anybody listen to Tuba Skinny that I picked last week? I did. They're good. They're fun. Aren't they good? Aren't they good? Okay, fine. Alan, what do you have for us? I have a book that I read just recently. It's called The Outlaw Ocean um, Mm -hmm. by Ian Urbina. And this is, it's one of those, I was, I was initially, it came up in my list of books to read. Um, 
And I said, oh, you know, great. Another another policy book about a complicated issue that I can't probably do much about, but I'm going to read it because, you know, I want to be a good, good informed citizen. <laughs> and, and it is that, I mean, it's a, it's about a complicated policy situation that probably most of us don't have a lot of power to change. Um, but it is a riveting read. I mean, this thing hmm. is a page turner. Um, it's about international waters and what goes on there. And, uh, and it's horrifying in a lot of parts as some of parts of it are funny. Um, but it's also, um, you know, it's really important because two thirds of our planet is covered in ocean and we have nobody in charge of most of it. And so there's a tremendous amount of exploitation and pollution and human carnage that's going on there that just, you know, it's nobody's, nobody's there to enforce anything in a lot of respects. Um, but what Urbina does is he goes onto various ships and experiences all this firsthand. I mean, he go, he travels with Sea Shepherd as they're chasing somebody down who's violating fishing laws. And he travels with, um, uh, with the, um, with a couple of different coast guards of different nations. And he gets onto a, a Thai fishing trawler at one point and, and just these situations where, um, you know, often horrifying things are going on. I'm, I'm really glad there are journalists like him who do stuff like that. I have absolutely no interest in pursuing that kind of journalism. Um, you know, and, and at one point he's uh, in his, in his hotel and, and the hotel manager comes and hands him a nine mil millimeter pistol and says, you need this. Um, so it's, it's stuff like that. Um, but really, really a fun read and an, an important read, I think. Alan, do you want to be in charge? In charge of what? Well, you said there's no the one ocean? in charge of the earth. Yeah, the no, ocean. No, no, not me personally, unless I got a cool trident to carry around when I'm doing it. Yeah, we could arrange that. Okay, yeah. that I, I'd be on to that. Uh, Rich, I just bought it, Alan. I just my it. Kindle. Good. I, I think, Rich, you will particularly enjoy this. Rich, what do you have for us? Well, back at you, Dixon. I got a pick for you. This is, I, I don't think this has been picked before. I just looked. Yeah, it's it's a, uh, a site uh, that's a photographer's website. Uh, his name is Anand Varma. Uh, and he does uh, all sorts of different sort of, we'll call it laboratory nature photography. Yes. Where he's, uh, where he's um, uh, photographing various creatures under laboratory conditions where he can get... Um, uh, you know, sort of special looks at him. He's got several different projects. One's called Parasites. That's yes. why I thought of you, Dixon. Yes. Another yes, one called you. Bees. Another one called Hummingbirds. Another one called Bats. Mm. Uh, and in particular, the Hummingbirds and the Bats, he's got them uh, flying through uh, a little bit of smoke or something like that. So you can yeah. see yeah. what the turbulence does. The uh, Parasites one have some just really nasty looking worms. <laughs> Dude. Coming out of people. And actually, the other Parasites one has uh, one that we've talked about on TWIV, which yeah. is this. Yes. Uh, uh, it's one of these. Um, uh, Fungi that uh, attacks the uh, There's a, a, a virus that makes uh, a. Makes uh, a an lady insect bird beetle. Yeah. Makes the ladybird yeah. beetle sort of. Uh, makes Protect it, uh, the protect the cocoon the, the pupa of the wasp yeah. that, has, that yeah. has infected it yeah, yeah we did that I think on this Twitter. was the one titled on a leaf no one can hear you scream. that's it yes. that's <laughs> it that's it on a leaf that was alan yeah on a leaf no one can hear you scream <clears throat> oh, so at any cool. rate these are beautiful photographs and there's some they are also some uh, bits in here about uh how he actually does it so nice very cool Thank you, um so i want to before i pick i want to shout out i just gave a little talk to uh, students in a virology course at Northeastern State University, which is in Oklahoma. <laughs> so that's not a Northeastern state. Yeah, yeah I know, but that's the name of the university. It's in Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Okay. So thanks well, for having okay. me. And I hope some of them are going to listen. I know their, their teacher cool. listens. Cool. So she, uh, nice. she's going in when she introduced me, you know, she told us the weather, which is very cool. It's pretty mm -hmm. mild there in Oklahoma. No tornadoes? <laughs> no. Uh, my pick is 
I do this every year at the same time because it's spring. I'm teaching my virology course at Columbia University, and I record all the lectures. I put them on YouTube, so you can take a virology course, uh, virology.ws slash course. And this uh, last year, this was interrupted by the pandemic, but I remember every lecture I would try to in, in integrate some result that we had just gotten. Uh, and I remember early on, you know, they had isolated the virus by putting bronchoalveolar lavage on cells and looking for CPE. And I told them, you see, I teach you real life stuff. <laughs> CPE <laughs> can be used. So this year we have still a lot of that. And uh, of course, so if you're the person who always asks, when am I ever going to need this? Yes, well. <laughs> when am I going to need it? So many things uh, relevant that I'm trying to include every lecture, uh, things relevant to um, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, virology.ws slash course. And I was very sad. You know, I just posted, I mean, last year's course went crazy, people, almost a million views of uh, the first mm. lecture. And this year we're doing pretty well, but then I got the transcription and RNA processing and there's no interest. Rich, what do you think of that? Hey, what can I say? <laughs> Oh you know, boy. People, it's real it's real easy for people to go blank when you start talking about the details of nucleic acids and stuff. But it's I tough. said, you know, this is how these mRNA vaccines are being made with an RNA <laughs> polymerase and a promoter, you know? Yep. <laughs> anyway. Um, so that is my pick, and that is it for TWIV 717. Uh, you can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twiv. Send your questions and comments to twiv at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, please consider supporting us. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. We do appreciate everyone's uh, support, which has increased uh, in the past year, as you might guess. Our guest today from Rockefeller University, Paul B. Nash, thanks for coming. Happy to be with you. And Theodora Hatsuanu. Thank you, Theodora. Thank you. That was a great conversation. I learned so much and I appreciate True. that you True. stuck with us for two hours. <laughs> it's really Pleasure. great. And I hope our listeners love it. Dixon de Palmier is at trichinello.org and thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. I loved it. Loved it. This was great. Stay safe, Dixon. Shall do that. Rich Conda is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. And thank you, Paul. Thank you, Theodora. Alan Dove is at alandove.com on the Twitter. He is Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.